a multi-million dollar studio at your disposal in the mid 90s but all you have is a sp1200 sample mm. that can sample what six seconds in mono yeah, 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 then yeah. you have to sample records at 45 rpm yeah. and pitch them down inside yeah, 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 that's right. you will get that lo-fi sound you will get that lo-fi feel and you will get that lo-fi swing and that's that's what i mean about limitations <laughs> KillerKellerOfficial.com THTC, the UK's leading ethical streetwear label. Organically grown and ethically built garments from hemp, organic cotton and other sustainable materials. 2019 is their 20th anniversary year. Join me with THTC as a Killer Keller podcast sponsor celebrating music, social activism, hemp and street culture. THTC, eco-fashion redefined since 1999. 101.4 FM, 24 hours a day, all genres. Flexfm.co.uk Beatbox created. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Cowan Podcast. Recording. Yeah, it is. We is are. it? Yeah, we're in business. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Killer Keller Podcast reporting to you live and direct in Copenhagen. Hagen. <laughs> and what a beautiful setting. Let's switch this on right now. We're inside the house with a, a rarely seen gentleman, but yet such a huge inspiration to a lot of people in the world of uh, scratch DJing and turntablism and general uh, sound manipulation, selection and more. Hip hop's very own, Denmark's very own DJ noise inside the place. How was that? It was very good, very nice introduction. Yeah. Except we're not inside the house, we're actually outside the house. Yeah, it's true, it's true. Well, they're inside the house. They are, they are, yeah. They, most of the people are inside yeah, the house I right should, now. Yeah, I should hope so. Or well, at least in a car listening to this and subscribing. Big shout out to Graffiti Kings as well. Um, mate. Yeah. We were just saying, actually, how refreshing it is that, um, you know, to, to, to be in the circumstances we are in in this world and to have... Uh, the opportunity to even fucking connect. To connect, yeah. A lot of people only connect through the internet these days. Yeah. Now we're here actually face to face. Yeah. Both seemingly COVID survivors. <laughs> COVID survivors. <laughs> COVID, COVID crew survivors. COVID crew survivors, yeah. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of the, I guess it's the gold standard people that are hug that are hugging these days. You know, those, those are the ones that have had it. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Always uh, stay away one, from the huggers. Yeah, stay away from the huggers. <laughs> the, those are the ones with the antibodies, and they might still be infected. I don't know. For sure. Um, the uh, the length in which we... I mean, the last time I think we saw each other... Now, we did try and we did try and clock this one in. I thought we'd met uh, like a little earlier than this, but you're saying that the last time we actually connected eye to eye, hanging out, yeah. was 1999. Yeah, in New York. I remember very vividly being in a hotel room and you were doing a, a Justin Timberlake beatbox impression thing to to get a hold of some girls. And it worked. Charming, charming, <laughs> charming, you know. Can't take the jungle out of the cat, can no, you? No, you can't, definitely. <laughs> Especially if you put the cat inside the big apple jungle, then something happens. That was an amazing time, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Glorious days. I mean, today is still a glorious day, but... Yeah. They were definitely glorious days. It and was just other levels. It was. It was. It just felt like. I mean, particularly being in New York as well. I mean, that place. You feel like you're in the center of the earth anyway. At best of times. The mecca. Yeah. Definitely the mecca, and you feel like you're surrounded by legends, and that's because you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are surrounded Genuine. by legend. You can't really look at a street corner without it being somewhere where Big L was rhyming, or. That's right. Somewhere where. They you know, make they make the corner. Yeah. As 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 prestige as yeah. them as artists being. Yeah, definitely. Legends. Definitely murals all over the place, and you know, meeting at that time, you know, meeting people like Kid Capri and Red Alert, and going to table turns and A Track is there, and all the the, the Allies crew, and and just just incredible, mind blowing, mind blowing, incredible, and a, a very fortunate time to be alive and active on the scene yeah. to be able to experience it. For sure. Yeah. So many. Th- songs as well i mean this is the other thing about culture is like when you i can remember the songs that were playing in the cars yeah. you know Gig hot 97 you know yeah, yeah. simon says it just come out yes and like <laughs> exactly such a <laughs> collect all the flies because we're here m- kind of thing my god yeah. yeah no that's right simon says just came out mm-hmm. little did they know how much pharaoh would be able to would have to pay for that 
yeah, with yeah. the Godzilla sample. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But then again, there were still great times. Yeah, yeah. Iconic and, d- dude, uh, y- d- a-, a staple song in anyone's uh, classic hip hop DJ set, right? Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, for a lot of people that are fans of the show and uh, big up the regulars, um, it will come as no surprise that you and me are sitting here talking because your name, in the, especially in the DJ world, you know, the DJ reverts, the DJ crazes, the scratch perverts, the DJ renegades, they all cite you as being a figurehead in the, the turntable world. And uh, particularly at a time where, you know, the, the, the DMC was at its, at its peak of, there was, there was a celebrity buzz with every DJ that jumped on. It was a golden era, wasn't it? It was, You yeah. were one of those c- contenders, bro. Like, that, I mean, that's right. But all the people you just mentioned, I mean, they are also my peers and people I look up to. Mm. You know, from, from Renegade to Thing to First Rate to Tony to, I mean, Prime Cuts, yeah. all, all of them, all of them people that I really, you know, they were not just my peers, but also my heroes. Mm-hmm. And the same goes with the American side crew. Obviously, Anthony Raider, rest in peace, and, and Rob and and Mike and Q mm-hmm. and Shortcut and Babu and all the just all the people that you know Eclipse. Just you, you, you can rant off all the names, and mm. they were a big part of why the DJ part was such a hot pot to sip from yeah. in the in the nineties yeah. because and the early two thousands because there was so much talent. Mm. Still is today. Mm. I mean, I I always. I always have been and always will be a part of the DJ culture Uh, and some of the people that stand out today are still incredibly talented Mm -hmm. from from a perspective of a 2K perspective Um, but that time Mm -hmm. when I was alive and still active on the scene the people I can name are the people that I really felt had a a tremendous impact on moving the the culture forward leaps and bounds Mm -hmm. Um, and then I kind of kind of just became an observer not a participator this intrigues me this intrigues me my brother because like i think about uh your position in the the, the game and uh yeah like i said at the top of the at the top of the show like seldomly seen and um it was almost like there was an international the international side of things it it almost it was almost like you disappeared sounds a bit negative and a bit uh, a bit strong hmm. because you was I knew I knew from the grapevine that you were doing a lot of other stuff in production a um, bit of modelling here and there from what I remember <laughs> you know this kind of th- there was a status that you were developing in your country and then you got into d- different syncs and stuff like that musically and whatnot yeah. and club world but but for the rest of the for the rest of the world it was it was very much a yeah, where'd the noise go? You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. That kind of, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. But I mean, I mean, we kind of briefly just chatted about that before we started the podcast, but it was not like a, it was more of like an, uh, I just took it like an international hiatus. Mm. Like I didn't, I didn't travel as much. And it come, I think it comes natural with the fact of becoming a father mm. in the early 2000s and you want to spend more time with your family and then if you have mm. an opportunity to base your e- economy and, and whatever you do, around the country where you live, so you don't have to do that much traveling. Mm. Um, that'll, it'll, it'll strengthen your bond to your family yeah. and it'll, it'll, you know, keep your relationship going. I've been, been with my wife for 20 years now and we've been married for 10. That's crazy, have, so have good. Three daughters and stuff. Mm. And I, I don't think, I mean, it might have happened, but I don't think it, we would have had just as good a chance if I was constantly Constantly yeah, leaving, out on the road. leaving Copenhagen every weekend, yeah, yeah. and just not coming back. You know, leaving yeah. Friday, coming back on the Monday, and sometimes going away for two weeks at a time on a yeah. tour. Yeah. I don't think it could happen. Yeah. I think, I think, um, I think that's where a lot of, of relationships fall apart. Anyway, yeah. when when stuff like that happens, all the all the time apart will eventually take its toll. I as, would uh, I would argue that that's probably the same case with DJs. It, it takes its toll, and, and you lose your own foothold because you do toilet tours yeah you know what i mean you do little club sets with bar money you know what i mean and you 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 lose perspective the the good thing about the dmc's and the scratch world is that it was seasonal to a degree that's right you know you you do the champs you win yeah everyone celebrates Mm. and then you go back and practice like it it, that was the deal right yeah i mean you took uh after you after you win i'm pretty sure most of the dmc champions like me will agree that 
you win a world championship and then you spend like the next two or three years while you're still kind of a, a, a active or or um on on the hot on the hot, hot on the lips mm. of the world championship names you sp- you spend some time going overseas to different countries judging the uh, the semi semifinals and the regional finals and then the world uh, the country finals yeah. and and doing showcases at the time it's it's what it encompasses a lot of the uh, world champion responsibilities to go mm. around and actually making sure because if they have local competitions say if you went to i don't know Sweden mm. to to do the Swedish DMC yeah. then if it was only Swedish judges, there so there will always be a lot of murmuring in the, yeah. in the backstage about did they judge it correctly? Yeah, yeah. But if they put a a world champion there to judge it, it, it kind of silences a lot of the critics For because real. they know there's actually a, a layman's, you know, a, a, a proper a, ju- a judge there who's completely neutral, but then also very very uh, skilled in order to judge the competition. Mm. So that. You sp- you spent some time doing that, but that only lasts you know two, three, four years, and then, yeah. and then and then now it's what we're twenty twenty. It's been twenty four years. Yeah. Since I won the world championship, that's oh, incredible, right? That's just crazy. Yeah, twenty four years. Uh, and, uh, and if you look back, the people that I thought was mad, my heroes like the Cash Money who won in nineteen eighty eight. Yeah. Uh, to think it's thirty two years ago that that man won the. I mean, me and Cash were. P- I think we were the only ones to win both the NMS and the DMC. Um, like A Track was also the only one to win the Table Turns, Vest Tax, and DMC. Mm. I think mm. some of the people that hold multiple champions uh, championships, um, even though they're a long time ago, it kind of follows you around yeah. like a PhD for the rest of your life. That's so sick. Cash is still a very, very skilled and very, very entertaining yeah. DJ. Yeah, so is A Track. For real, yeah. You know and. And I think the people that have moved within different competitions or held several titles, like Craze as a triple DMC champion, yeah, yeah. Mike, Q, all these people. Insane. It's the kind of thing that if you if you did put in the work at the time you were active and, and got a chance to hold multiple championships, mm. then that kind of it sticks with you like on your resume. Yeah, for real. Because today, if you want to promote yourself on social media, what do you do? You say, well, I'm, I'm a very good DJ. Yeah. Go, well, anybody can say that. Now you have to have those credentials. They Just have to be in there. Put put down, you know, multiple world champion. Yeah. And nobody argues with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though it might be 50 years ago you won them. Yeah. <laughs> They, yeah. don't, they don't care. It's just a PhD. That's right. So if it works for a visa, it works for the world. <laughs> that's that's, that's right. true. That's right. You know. That's right. Um, I remember, bro. Like you know, and, and I look up to you, bro. I looked up to you when I was a kid. <laughs> you know, what I mean, still standing. I, I look up to you because I remember in well, man, it must have been ninety three, ninety four. I got my first DMC video, <laughs> and uh, I think Rock Raider won this one. He he won this this uh, world, but. Um, your routine was staggeringly clean. Oh, we're talking about uh, 95 and the Hippodrome. That's the one. That's the one, yeah, yeah. That's the one. The and Hippodrome, the, yeah. Bro, like, you, you did the beat juggle, for, and I said it to you earlier, it was like, it was the first time, A, I'd heard it done so on time without a single delay or skip or anything. Mm-hmm. But also you were replicating another beat. Um, what beat was that? I forget what it was now. Yeah, that's... Um that's uh, this is the nerdy section of the podcast, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We took a <laughs> we took a, a, a drum pattern from um, the Honey Drippers in Peach the President, still and and changed it into. Um, is it still going? Okay, so it's it's going, going. <laughs> and changed it into the Audio Two's uh, top villain because that that's was a it. very classic hip hop song at the time. But um, incredible. I was, I was actually trying to reveal to you the fact that the thing that you don't know about. All these routines, the way that, for, for instance, Rob Swift would share with Raider some juggles and then they would sharpen this steel until that routine became perfect. That was also the case with the with that particular mm-hmm. juggle I did that mm-hmm. you mentioned because um, there were three versions of that you could have used. You could either use the honey drippers in Pizza President uh, and then there would be another element to it where you could use where they say ladies and gentlemen and put that into the mm-hmm. juggle. Yeah, or you could have used uh, Big Daddy Kane's smooth operator, That's where, right. they, where they cut in the impeach the president, yeah. and then he says, "Girls, step up to this," and then you can put the step up to this into the juggle. But that would be good in a battle if you were against another person looking sure. at him. Step up to this. Yeah, yeah. But the choice came down to using 
Super Lover C and Casanova Rudd's Do The James mm. because that was the record that had the hardest beat yeah. of the Impeach Hardest the, fuck. Yeah, yeah in, uh, of, of all those three records, yeah. where did the Impeach the President drum break sound the hardest? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that was on the Do The James. So that was actually Typhoon here from Denmark that came up and said, listen, it sounds best with this one. You should use that one. Big up Typhoon as well. Mm -hmm. All day, that's my guy. So, yeah. You say, I, I, interestingly, like, uh, and, and this is something I've, I've probably never delved too deep into, but, but when, you, when you're dealing with vinyl and you're, for impact, you're hitting the, the, the kicks and snares, but when you're practicing mm -hmm. to keep the clarity on it, that often is the, the biggest issue with original vinyl, isn't it? It starts yeah. getting dusty, yeah, yeah. you know, so but, you lose the impact. Yeah, but also at that, at that time, at that period of time, The, the question of which record sounded the best was actually a, a very important aspect of where you, how you place together your routine. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, most of, if something doesn't sound right, you can just optimize it on your file and make it bang. Yeah. At that time, you'd had to choose records that actually did bang. Yeah. So I remember doing, I don't think I ever used it in a, in a competition, but I did a, like a, a small juggle with EPMD's It's My Thing. Mm -hmm. But the, the American 12-inch didn't really sound that good because it was on 33 it wasn't a really good pressing and when i was doing the juggle it, so I, i got a hold of a of a uk pressing which was on 45 oh and because it's on 45 just like most of the seven inch reggae tunes and yeah. stuff it had more data per round so and oh that's sick okay. and the record all, all as well or the record spins faster so you'd have to be faster yeah, yeah, yeah. but at that time that was just something you'd have to learn dude that was just yeah in order to get the the hardest sounding record there's two people i know that can get away with it and pull it off is dj woody and mr thing yeah. they, these kind of like and, and of course like hype these guys work with 45s like yeah no, but here's a quick thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then oh, well, also um scratch bastard he, yeah he does it a lot he puts on a couple of 45s and goes at it Um, but yeah, but because of the size of it and the data in which is in it, it they're, they're the higher sounding. Yeah, Jack. Like if you take a, say, 90 BPM break, yeah. and if you put it on a 45, that might be a, a, a rotation and a half uh -huh. uh, on one bar. Uh -huh. But on 33, that might only be like three quarters of a rotation. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, so the, the faster the record, obviously, the faster you have to be. Yeah. We're just lucky we didn't have to work with the old lacquer records that went 78 yeah yeah for real for real <laughs> and they were easy rippable as well like, yeah Ooh, fuck me man yeah for real but this is that's this is the real nerdy section we yeah that will be way too we're much of a deep. podcast to dive into yeah 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 yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's deep it's deep plus i've only got 88 percent on the, on the battery we're on a location <laughs> here baby yeah if you're not watching and you're listening we are in a, a beautiful setting right here um another thing that i'm finding with uh particularly like fucking on point scratch DJs, I, mm. aka yourself. I, and I saw it last night again, it was just like a whole revisit in my, my, my memory bank of like, wow, that's fucking sick. Is, um, and Prime Cuts is another person. Mm -hmm. uh, you all hold the key to drumming. Yeah. You, you have this drumming thing and, and when you see you guys cut and stuff, it, it kind of, it, it shows through. Yeah. Yeah, you said that you felt like um, the scratch DJ's solo would be like a drum solo. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to completely agree with you. I mean, I started out as a drummer just in a school band mm. and I know Prime Cots was a drummer as well and kind of rekindled my thing with drumming after I seen Jason just getting back into, mm -hmm. you know, or just really taking up drumming and now being a part of a band and stuff. Mm. But just because it kind of, you can spend, you know, these days I only spend about an hour a day on the turntables. Mm. And, and sometimes it will get trivial because you, you end up going back to your set ways. Do you? Yeah, kind of just... You an don't, hour a day? Yeah. You do it an hour a day still? Yeah, yeah, still. Every day, one hour. And um, the thing is, but after, uh, sometimes it becomes more because you kind of... You travel, trail off. Yeah, yeah. trail off. Um, but it, you kind of get sort of stuck into like scratch patterns and you try to combine combine the patterns and you know going from the different styles and putting them together and but then sometimes if you pick up say an instrument mm. or, or do something else mm -hmm. you know you spend some time on the mpc or or you mess about with your your moog or moog mm -hmm. i think that's what it's called yeah and yeah i always call it a moog or the drums or whatever yeah. or just sitting on a cajon whatever yeah. and just drumming away yeah. it's it gives you um 
you know the whole expansion of your mind yeah. it's also an expansion of your theory and yes. an expansion of your of your talent thousand percent and then when you get back on the turntables you go I wonder if i could do a similar thing to do the yeah 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 yeah, yeah. If you, can I do that on the on this <laughs> with that? And then you, you try it out. Yeah, yeah. And then that kind of expands your repertoire. So I think there will always be a, a, a room for improvement and yeah. always be room for development of you, your chops and, and your talent as an artist. Yeah. It's just the, the way you go about it, which one is the most effective. Yeah. And to me, anyway, the most effective is just to try as many things as possible, not necessarily just the turntables. For sure. I mean, the inspiration can draw you from, can be drawn from anywhere. I mean, I've, I've, you know, the podcast itself, I'm like inspired to do more with beatboxing now that I have it as a platform. And then people come up with ideas like that and I'm like, yo, mm. of course, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, with hip hop itself, and this is the thing that people forget, like as a scratch DJ and a juggler, you're constantly finding new instruments and sounds to sample and whatnot. There was a time where that was ex exclusive to hip hop. Yeah. It was so important that you found different genres and different things to kind of draw in those inspirations, right? That's right. In this day now, it's a very different climate where, you know, the sampling game is, you, you want to try and avoid it at all costs. Yeah, but yeah. But there's something really romantic and inspiring about pulling out a record and hearing a different instrument and trying to manipulate it to your own theories. Yeah, I think I think that it all comes down to the fact that I mean, with technology these days, the the whole cre the whole the whole process of make, making music have become so uh, accessible to anybody mm. that obviously it will create a lot of faults, mm. a lot of very bland music because. Uh, there are only certain, you know, digital audio workstations you can work with, and certain sample packs, and the people that, the people that s seek to create music the same way as they would if they were a Spotify yeah. user just listening to music on Spotify. Those are the people that will create the copy paste music, yeah. where the people that search out odd sounds and and um, not necessarily just on records, but experiment. The people that don't mind seeing limitations as a way of expanding limits, mm. uh, it's those are the ones that will come up with the the really good stuff these days. Yeah, yeah. So if I pick up a record from, say, 1963 as a Turkish prog rock record or mm. a, mm. a mm. Jewish bar mitzvah record or something, mm. I will never come close to having that guitar in that room going through that amp yeah. at that time playing that note. So if I sample that note, that's a sonic piece of history that I can then change and use as my own instrument. Yeah. And that's, I think that's what the diggers to me, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole concept of digging and, and finding records that have a certain sonic a yeah. a a aesthetic, that's what it gives me. It's the so whole, important. Yeah, it's, to me it's important anyway. You'll never and get that sound in any other con con context. You have to, if you, if you are searching for something in your head, you, you have to be able to... Yeah, yeah, and I think that's just the way, if you've been brought up that way making music, yeah. then that's what, um, that's what you're going to excel at. Like, yeah. for instance, I, I, I'm from the premier Pete Rock, yeah. 45 yeah. King, you know, that, that kind of era. Yeah. Um, uh, favorite producer of all time is Knotts from Virginia. Um, okay. But, but, but that era like Premier was talking about, well, if I'm doing something and I need a piano on it, I know exactly what that piano is supposed to sound like. And he mm. said, I'll go through all my records till I find that piano sound. And uh, and that's the same way as uh, uh, a 2K producer will just scroll through presets mm -hmm. till he finds a piano. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Premier will scroll through his records to find mm -hmm. a piano. And I think both ways are equally good. Yeah, that's, right, that's right. But you need both ways yeah. to have a diversity in the music field thousand percent globally right? exactly and you can't you can't restrict people to like you know only having those sample packs and those i mean there's also the argument that you know with those same sample packs being repeated certain key of songs you know they trigger what so, we would class there yeah, yeah, yeah and, and next thing that's the thing that's in the charts and then everything sounds like fucking yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it, I guess it's ebbs and flows. It swings and roundabouts. Everyone, it's happened across generations. So I'm yeah. sure we're not talking anything new to a lot of people that are older than us. But no, but there's a certain certain rules of thumb that you can always apply. Mm. Uh, 
I heard Ninth Wonder talking about, um, which is a rule of thumb. It's funny I heard him say it because it's what my music teacher in school said to me. He said, if you can hum it, you can play it. Mm. And that's basically it. Everybody's got a tune inside their head. Mm -mm. And if you've been listening to music for a long time, you you know what kind of melody you want and mm -mm. you'll come up with stuff. You'll that's just right. hum stuff along. Yeah. And then if you have a, a small kind of... Um, knowledge about music production and, and music theory that will turn into being able to build on top of that melody you'll be able to mm. put a bass line underneath it and put some rhythm to it and, and then some the building blocks will, are there yeah, some music will come out of it the building blocks doesn't have to be drag and drop dra mm. uh, drag and drop yeah. in your in your beautiful digital blocks office. all across <laughs> your screen <laughs> no they can be from your mind yeah, yeah. you just have to put your, yeah. your hands to the damn keyboard That's or fine. on the guitar on the on the percussion pad or whatever I mean you were talking about Scott Storch before we jumped into this and you know that was Timberland Mm. Pharrell, they all have that theory. You know, I know Pharrell, in speaking to him, he would just hum a sound, do it on the dictaphone. Mm. Um, and you know, Timberland's work is flooded with vocal percussion, you yeah. know. Yeah. It's a, it is a tried and tested formula. Yeah, because most of the time, it's also another rule of thumb, is that obviously if you can bang it out on the table, uh. then you can also bang it out with your mouth. Yeah. Right? And then when you... A lot of people have this whole structure about chord structures or the whole... They have a passion about chord structures and the way they go through. Mm. But in the end, nobody hums a chord. No, you can't. You don't have... You, nobody does that. Yeah, you yeah. can't hum a three or four yeah, note code. No, I tell this people all the time. They say, do an impression of that beat. Do an impression of that song. It's like, dude, you don't understand. Yeah. The piano's impossible. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. And the, the way if, if you say, well, what does Madonna's material girl sound like? That's not a that's not a chord. That's a it's, lead. It's, it's a, a lead. Yeah. 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 So it's it's all about the leads and the chords are definitely substantial to put underneath. Mm. And that's the same way with I think hip hop has kind of what hip hop has given the world with people like Prince Paul sampling multiple records but they're all in the same key and putting them together for Crazy. Devil's Soul. Uh, Pete Rock, the way he would he would filter stuff out to mm. make uh, a bass line and then put stuff over the top of it Crazy. and then add stuff. Mm. You know, like... Um, like the beat miners and just that is I think that's what mm. urban music hip hop has given the world mm. the, the exploration if you if you don't have a, a multi-million dollar studio at your disposal in the mid 90s but all you have is a SP 1200 sample mm. that can sample what six seconds in mono yeah, 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 then you yeah. have to sample records at 45 RPM yeah. and pitch them down in yeah, size yeah, yeah, that's right. you will get that lo-fi sound you will get that lo-fi feel and you will get that lo-fi swing and that's that's what I mean about limitations mm. create, uh, uh, give, it makes it makes you more creative to have limitations. See what I'm saying here? I'm not the only one speaking this shit, boy. <laughs> um, you know, I've been checking a show from Show and AG mm. that, um, I can't remember the name of the album, the one with um, Big Pun's verse on where he's like, <laughs> like yeah, you yeah, know the one I'm yeah, talking about, right? about yeah. His production on that album is just like fucking floor. And I, I completely slept on it for Raucous. Raucous came out at the same time as that, you know, this, this Company Flow era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I just dropped straight into Company Flow so hard. Yeah. I slept on that show and AG album and I'm like, yo, like the production is sick. So yeah. good. Well, the, the thing is that if, you, if you're from the album era, mm. That's the, th that's the thing with the streaming these days. Mm. And even back to when iTunes became a thing, it was all about the single. Yeah. Just buy the single or stream the single. But if you're yeah. a person that will dig albums, if you go back and dig through, say, some of Buster Rhymes' albums, or um, I, as you said, some of the Show and AG albums, or even the, the, the Black Moon albums, yeah. the oh. Tribe albums. Oh. EPMD. EPMD oh, albums. Sermon. So, Jesus some of, the, some of the album cuts yeah. are incredible. incredible. I mean, one of the best... If you, even if you go kind of new school, it's not new school, but dilated. Mm -hmm. If you go back to some For of the sure. albums, the, the track they have, the, last, yeah. the, um, the Eardrums Pop track. Yeah, uh -huh. with just, well, it's just incredible. Yeah, yeah. Was it Alchemist? Uh, I'm not sure if it was him or it was Evidence. It's one of the two. Well, they're, Evidence is a bad man as well, though. They're, both just, they're basically brothers. Dumb. <laughs> yeah, it's just <laughs> silly. They're so, I mean, and the, yeah, they feed up each other anyway, yeah. but this... The album cuts on there yeah. are incredible, yeah. and that's you know, if you get if you get into the the behind the scenes work, and if you mm. if you you will have 
more than just the single to listen to. Yeah. yeah there might an education be. in those records, for real. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and also if you go back and if you look at, like, Biggie's album as a classic, definitely. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but the album cuts on there that would never make the radio are just incredible. Some of know? the remixes as well that came off the back of that first album. Yeah, <gasps> yeah, yeah definitely. Oh my God, we won't get into those juggles. <laughs> that, yeah, and I mean, if that's, that's, but I mean, we are talking about golden era stuff here. Yeah. Even if you go, you know, after 2000 and, and further into, there's yeah. a lot of, say the UK, for instance, I remember being in the DMC, just, I think I was just judging or something at the time, Mark B and Blade stuff came out. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark if, B tore it, wow. Yeah, wow. yeah, right, right, tore it apart. And, and the singles were incredible, but yeah. the album in itself is just incredible as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. So I think that is the one thing that streaming might have ruined, the art form of the album. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that should probably, I'm not, sh- I'm not saying it should come back, but I'm pretty sure it will come full circle at yeah, some yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, people sure. will start getting into saying, I like that artist, let me check out their entire 12 songs on this album. Do you think that comes with age? Because I sometimes delve into like, more punk stuff, uh, earlier hip hop stuff, even some of the newer acts. Like, I mean, you know, like Post Malone, you know, like yeah. I, I go back to maybe some of his early, early stuff. Mm-hmm. And I do that because I feel like the hype's died a little bit. Yeah. And the, the integrity of him to be into his third or fourth album, mm-hmm. that gives it enough weight for me to say, hey, you know what? Mm. There's got to be a reason. I'm going to listen to this. Yeah from the beginning yeah that's bec- well I think it's I think it's the whole I think it's the whole imagery mm. versus the sonic expectation yeah. expectations I mean if you say Post Malone everybody goes oh that's a tattooed fat dude with yeah. the, the black yeah. the long black hair he looks like fucking Ron Jeremy with tattoos yeah. whatever if you go back and listen to the early stuff you see where the talent is coming mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. and I think it's the it's the the, the expectations of what they look like versus the sonic capabilities it goes all the way back to say Aretha Franklin. For real. If 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 she was born at a time where you'd have to look good, mm. you'd have to be Rihanna looking good, mm. or say uh, Britney looking good in order to to sell, mm. would she have had a chance mm. market wise? That's right. No, I agree. Sonically, she would bury anybody, but That's would right. she have had a chance market wise? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's the biggest conundrum, isn't it? Because and I think it, with with hype, once hype passes, yeah, yeah, you 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 get into the more meat and veg of a of a of a project, don't you? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What's the future for your projects, my brother? What's going on? Well, I think the future is is as a, a wise man once said to me when I was on tour with him. <laughs> wise man being just a Danish R and B singer <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that I was on tour with a couple of years ago. He said something that struck a chord with me. He said. What do you want to do? And I said, Well, I just, I guess, I just want to, you know, enjoy music and enjoy my family, and you know. And he said, No, but what do you want to do? I said, Well, what do you mean? He said, Like proper life outlook. What, what, what gives you pleasure? I was like, Well, it gives me pleasure being near water, mm-hmm. being near the coast, being able to go into nature, and then mm-hmm. heading back to my studio and actually feeling creative because I've had so much input from, from nature. That goes yeah. way back uh-huh. from a Norwegian family. We used, we used to go out on skis all day and not come back till the sun went down. Um, so he said, you've lived half your life, mm. if mm. you're lucky. Mm. How do you want to live the rest of you, mm. the, the other half of your life? So the future to me holds staying here in Denmark, moving up north, moving near the sea, uh, setting up my studio, oldest daughter is going off to college, the two youngest are staying in school for a couple more years, and my wife and I are going to be living near the coast, and anybody from the UK or anybody in the hip-hop world is more than welcome to come visit me and do a collab <laughs> there you go, there you go. north of Copenhagen. Follow my uh, Instagram or Twitter or Hell Facebook yeah. to Hell find yeah. out where I'm at That's and right. find my studio's location mm-hmm. and hit me up if you want to do something. We'll, uh, we'll throw the bells and whistles on those uh, ads and Insta follows, man. Definitely. <laughs> Brother, you know, world champion, scratch master, turns list. I mean, the, the list goes on and... We found you. We got you. <laughs> you and found I me. You yeah. found me. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, DJ Noise in the place. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you, man. Superstar Killer Keller podcast once again, documenting the real, all right? All genres, discipline, street culture. We are like that. Thank you very much, Copenhagen. Peace. Peace.